the Audio Nowcast, sponsored by API and Wire World Pro Audio. Now from the Nowcast Network Studios, here's Mike. Hey, welcome to the Audio Nowcast. My name is Mike Rodriguez. Before we get going, let me introduce the guys. Starting with Mr. Martin Page. Martin, welcome. Woo-hoo! Great to be here. Great to be back with the team. It feels lovely and warm and cozy. Good stuff. Followed by Mr. Scott Grushin. Scott. Hi, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> Much too exciting. Much too exciting. <laughs> Next, we have the one and only Mr. Nick Beck. Good Ooh. evening, Mike. Good evening, gentlemen. I wish we had started recording 10 minutes ago because we have been laughing nonstop <laughs> for that entire time. But we were obscene before. We were obscene. <laughs> We would get we would get the little explicit label on this. Nobody's allowed to stand up, though, you know. Uh, and, and finally, we have the man, the myth, the mystery, Mr. Bobby Osinski. Bobby, so good to see you. Woo. Hi, everybody. Hey. You know, it's always a holiday when Bobby joins us. You know, mm. <laughs> it's always great. Well, it calms us down. We know somebody's in the room who knows what they're talking. About. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and Rob's going to join us. He's running a little late and he said to go ahead and start. So don't worry. His streak is alive. He will hit show number 217. This is show number wow. 217. So, wow. Uh, and we got a wow. lot to talk about. This is going to be a really great show. Um, and uh, just all kinds of really fun topics. There's all kinds of new hardware that that has come out and we're going to talk about the music business and we've got albums to come out and trailers to debut. Yes, we're going to debut a trailer at the end of the show. So uh, we got a lot of really fun stuff to talk about. But, you know, first thing, um, and I know none of you guys are prepared, but I, I want to talk about this and it's it's not going to sound as much of a bummer as, as it sounds. But, um, you know, Earlier this year, actually in June, uh, my father passed away. And so I've been going through um, his stuff with my mom and everything. And it's, and it's been nothing but wonderful memories and things like that. So this is not by any means a, a doubt or anything. But what was really amazing is I got to see stuff that was important to my dad. Like I got to see what was important and what, what like inspired him when he needed and it got me thinking and i'm super quick and i just want to open with this because i just i just want a, a little bit of an uplift from everybody do you guys have a piece of gear or something that you have um that just makes you feel good that's just like uplifting or or when you really need to you can really um like take a look at it take a glance at it because i have something and and, and uh, i just want to show you super quick and and this is a drum head that i got um when I toured with Al Jarreau and it's signed by Al and it's signed by Steve Gadd. Um, and it's one of Steve Gadd's uh, drum heads. And it, you know, you see all the black because he, Steve Gadd uses black sticks and everything. And the great thing about this, the reason why it makes me feel so good and it's really uplifting is because I almost got fired from that tour. <laughs> I was a newbie and I just came out. It was like my second tour. And so I didn't really like, I didn't really, I've, I never yeah. worked for a, the machine, you know, I worked for yeah. a smaller act and I never worked for the machine. And so I literally almost got fired. The tour manager had hips that came up to me and said, uh, you got to basically shape up or we're sending you home. And he, and he said that to me, he totally gave me that bummer while we were in Paris. And I was like, it was the most amazing city ever. And I get, you know, <laughs> I get this talking to him because I'm going to be going home if I don't straighten up. But I'll tell you what, I straightened up and I finished that tour. And so on the last day, I got that signed by, uh, by Al and Steve. And, and I look at it because it reminds me when things get tough and when things, when I feel like I'm going to be sent home, but that it just gives me like, you know what? I survived that. I can, I can survive anything. And so I just want to super quick, if you guys, do you have anything like that? I mean, Nick, do you have anything like that? Is there anything oh. that you look that you? Of course. Um, I mean, there's a couple of them, but the, the, uh, big one for me is a Radio Shack Moog MG1 synthesizer that's about this big. And the reason why is because it's my very first synthesizer. I bought it when I was 18 years old with the money that I had saved working at a toy store while in high school. And wow. the day that I, I was in Radio Shack playing with it every day, and then one day they dropped the price 
in half because they wanted to get it out the door. And I walked in there and went, <gasps> okay. And I wrote a check and it was, uh, it was the beginning of this. That's, that's fantastic. How about you, Martin? Do you have anything like that? Do you have any? No, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting question. I, you know, I, I, it made me think straight away that it probably would be for me, my, my Jupiter 8 Roland uh, synthesizer, because I, it was the first keyboard that I bought when I came in the 80s. And um, I've still got it in the back room here in the studio now, you know, it's, and it's still working, believe it or not, with all the dents in it. But when I look at that keyboard, you know, I get a, I think, again, I get a warm feeling and I think, oh, that's, that's uh, stayed with me all this, all through everything. And also, you know, last year, I think somebody offered me something like eight grand for it, you know, and it was like, no, no, I'll never sell that, you know. So, yeah, the Jupiter 8, <laughs> that's what it, that's, that's uh, my keyboard, yeah. So that reminds me of... Uh, I suppose 40 years of work. Yeah. It's pleasant memories and financial. Yeah. It's your financial little, you know, nest egg. <laughs> well, you I've, know seen, what? I've seen it as high as 15 grand. Seriously. Wow. It's oh, ridiculous. Wow. I'll sell it tomorrow then. No, no, you know, there we go. All right. It's 15. It's gone. <laughs> hey, Bobby, how about you? Do you have anything like that? I can't say I do. Uh, I just, no longer have an attachment to gear. Well, it doesn't have to be gear. It could be it could be anything. I mean, anything that yeah, which is fine. If you don't, I I I, I kind of like Bobby, man. He lives in the moment. I, honestly, I can't say I do. There's nothing I can think of. Well, that's that's great. That's great. I'm not How about be able you, to sell Scott? my Jupiter right to him? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you get him to sell it for you. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Scott? Goodness. I, I probably have two things. I have um, a pair of Sheps that um, were given to me my first microphones that I bought uh, from AEA. He called me up and he said, there's a matched pair of uh, these. And they're very warm sounding, which is very unusual for Sheps. Um, and, and what, uh, what's your second? My second, obviously, is... Uh, I have a PRS guitar that I kind of, I, I, it's a 513, but what made it special, and I didn't know it, I didn't really like the color, so I had them put it aside, but I wasn't sure I wanted to get it. Then I played all the other 513s in, the, in like 150 mile radius, because I'm that kind of weird person. I try every guitar I can find, but nothing sounded like this guitar. And then I bought it, and then I realized uh, it's what's unusual. It's fully Brazilian rosewood neck, mm. solid. So it's not just like a little strip. Like if I take it to Europe, they'll take it away from me. But um, it sustains and has a warmth to it that is unique. And 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 I just it's my baby. You know that sounds like an amazing guitar, and I can see why you would hold on to that and why it would be so inspirational. I will tell you this. I, I will tell you this. As we were going through my father's stuff and we're cleaning things out. Um, you know, things are just things. So I like Bobby's answer, you know, about, you know, just, you know, don't get attached to your gear because man, you see people that, that just have just stuff and, and the more you have, the more it kind of just weighs you down, you know? And so, you know, there's a certain elegance about just maybe having one or two special things, but, or nothing at all. And just kind of living in the moment and just kind of, just kind of be there. So Bobby, I think, uh, I think that's a, it's pretty awesome, you know, your the whole outlook in that. Well, I don't know that I'm living in the moment, like you say, but I don't have anything that gives me the warm and fuzzies either. <laughs> you need to get a woman. Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. You need to leave now. You need to leave Whoa. now. Find a real warm, fuzzy woman. Oh man, I miss Martin. I'm just like not saying anything at this point. <laughs> hey, uh, so let's let's move on. Speaking of gear, uh, you know, a ton of stuff happened this week, starting with like um, Black Magic Design and the Da Vinci um, 17 that came out with the updated uh, Fairlight uh, portion of their software, which, by the way, is really giving. Um, 
uh, Avid or run for its money, especially with Pro Tools, because it's free, you know? And, uh, you know, the fact that you can do multi-channel recording, built in Atmos, all this really cool stuff. It's really great. We won't talk about that, but you got to check it out. And then, obviously, Apple came out with their new hardware with the M1 chip. And they're basically consolidating everything and, and they, they want to get a, a common platform and you can run iOS apps on it. And their big thing is that, you know, they want to control their own universe. And, and one of the things we're going to talk about are, are these companies getting too big? Because let's face it, how long is it going to be until you can no longer slide load uh, programs into the Mac universe? You know, how long is it going to be until things are locked into in order to be, in Mac, you have to be, you know, authorized and go through the Mac store, which right now, a lot of software I use, you don't have to, you know, you can sideload all this stuff. And then finally, Avid came out um, today, as a matter of fact, with their carbon um, interface. And oh. it... Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, what was that? <laughs> and, uh, you know, the thing about there is, is if you even look at their marketing material, they're trying to, trying to get a closed environment and they're actually in you know talking about you know you no longer have to rely on third-party plugins and you can do it all with avid and avid plugins in their aax plugin format and uh and they have some cool things don't get me wrong one millisecond zero latent uh, monitoring real-time recording of of plugins i mean you could actually record your plugin and have minimal latency that's that's a pretty big deal but still like I don't know about you, but I use way more third-party plugins than I use Avid plugins, you know? So especially like Fab Filter and things like that. So um, just for a second, we're going to open it up. Uh, you guys, any of, these, any of these updates excite anybody? Anybody, uh, you know, want to chime in super quick? Well, I love DaVinci, um, and I've been using it since about version 11. And I always found the Fairlight audio software to be really lacking and really rudimentary. And it's because they bought the software and they threw it into you know, their code base pretty quickly. I'm very curious to see with version 17, you know, whether it's starting to have, you know, there were just a lot of rough edges as you're actually getting in there and working with it. But the software is amazing. I mean, the whole video editing software is amazing. I mean, it's better. I have it installed on my laptop because I downloaded the public beta and I said, yeah, I'll install this. And next thing I know it, oh, you can't have two versions of Resolve on your machine. So guess what? <laughs> I'm working on the public beta now on this big giant project. So that's a whole nother story. Uh, Bobby, any of these updates, uh, any of them give you a buzz? Well, I'm going to buy an M1 laptop. Uh, two reasons. One is I, I'm in that position where either I give the money to Apple or I give it to the federal government at the end of the year. So it's time for a new laptop. But the second thing is the current laptop that I have, the, the Power, um, MacBook Pro, is only two years old, but the fan, it makes me crazy. Yeah. So I'm just hoping that this one will have a, a fan that I can't hear. Bobby, well, you it well. Yeah. the big question. So as of right now, as of, you know, today, November, whatever it is, 13th, um, 2020, they're only releasing the M1 chip on 13 inch Macs, either the MacBook Air or the MacBook Pro. So I guess the question I have for you is, A, do you know, have you seen any difference between the Air and the Pro? Because it doesn't, on the surface, it doesn't look like it's a big difference to me. Well, and I mean, I could uh, yeah, go on. Now, I was going to say the big difference is, you know, obviously you have the, the pro uh, with the touch bar and the whole shebang, but also the pro has a fan built in so it can sustain higher performance, whereas the air doesn't. I, I don't know if you want to add to that, but I know that was one of the big things that um, that I had read um, the big difference between between the two, because the specs are the same and it's the same chip. Apple even said it themselves. It's the same chip. Yes, but it's only one fan as compared to now where there's two fans. Oh, 100%. And yeah. then, Bobby, um, so uh, when you look at software now, all the software that you use, is it easily available and will it work on these new Macs? Short of forgetting the audio software, but I'm talking about all of the writing and all of the things, the tools that you use. 
I believe so. Uh, I'm not going to jump in like tomorrow. I'm going to wait a week and wow. see <laughs> see what they have to say. But then uh, I'm definitely going to going to buy one. And if I have to wait, then I'll wait because I still do have a good working laptop. You know, I will. I'll agree with you. I am going to absolutely buy one of the new uh, Macs because the power that they say this thing has is pretty phenomenal. And I've been reading about the testing and some of the, uh, granted, these are some Mac-friendly test sites, but they're just saying that the, the benchmarks are out of this world. They're actually, the M1 is outperforming the i9 chip and that the, the heating is like, like Bobby, you know, what you were talking about. There's only one fan and it's, it, it doesn't throttle up nearly as fast or as often as, uh, as the, the Intel. So, I, I think it's, look, if you can get that kind of performance and you can get that type of power without a fan and a MacBook Air, for me, that just is like, that just, just gives me a buzz because, man, I, I can't tell you um, when it's time to travel again how awesome it is to have a tiny, small little MacBook Air that performs really well and is quiet. I'm with you. The fans you, just drive me. The thing that I don't like is the Mac Mini. So right now I'm in the midst of building an Atmos room. So I'm buying a bunch of Mac minis that are going to be used as my recorder and my RMU, et cetera, et cetera. So the problem is the Mac mini, 16 gigs. Yes. Not 32, not 64. Yes. So all of the people that need to be audio won't work. 16 no. gigs isn't big enough. You're 100% correct. That That's why I'm not going with the Pro. That's why I'm going with the Air because it's going to be for like, you know, checking footage and it's going to be for, uh, you know, light editing because I have, you know, you need at least 32, especially if you want to run. Why would um, they even resolve. build the architecture? I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed because why would they even build the architecture from the beginning with those restrictions? I mean, you already got to the point where the old Mac Mini at 64 gigs of RAM. Great. <laughs> You just did that a year ago. Now, all of a sudden, bam, yeah. the 16. I, you know what? What's the I point think, of that? To me, I think, it, I think it's a thermal thing. I think they're just trying to work out some of the stuff. And, uh, and let's face it, if you don't have a ton of RAM, that's, you know, along with everything else. I, I just think it's just an easy, manageable way to, to go into the market. And look, we've all been through this before, right? I mean, remember the power PC going from that to, to the Intel chip? It's but, like but the, it's the so transition. All of the listeners need to know, though. It's a big deal. Yeah. I just no. ordered two. Wait, I just ordered two Mac Minis. If Apple stops making the Mac Mini, I need to get up in January. None of the software is running, so right now I could be stuck. Well, they haven't pulled. If I need to, what's that? They haven't pulled anything yet. You can still buy MacBook Airs with Intel. You can still no, no, buy but the Mac Intel Mini. Zone. Can you still? When when do they stop making the Intel version? That. I don't know, but if, right I would now, I would venture to guess it's going to be a, probably at least a year because that was the the overflow not, last time. I was talking to Westlake Audio, and they're thinking it's going to be and we're swapping. And I, that I, you know, he, I I would say that that's not going to happen from everything I read, but who knows? It's Apple, and I think I think Apple, you know, they do their own thing, but um, but we'll be. We'll, We'll see what happens. I think, but I think the new hardware is going to be amazing. And I think, uh, you know, if there's no fan out there, I can't tell you how awesome that would be to have the power with no fan. Because I'm like, I'm like Bobby, man. That like those little fans and stuff like that just yeah, annoy they me sometimes, you know. And uh, and I will edit with headphones when my fan's buzzing just to not hear my fan because i'll use noise canceling headphones what do you so, guys think about all these pros especially musicians and composers that just laid down 15 to eighteen thousand dollars for the new mac pros and operating system wise it's kind of dead man walking a, yeah but it's a yeah but it's a different beast and and i don't think mac's not going to give up on intel you know overnight i don't i don't think they're going to well, but even if I it's a year or two if you're spending 15 to 18 grand you're hoping to get a life on that thing. I mean, you could yeah. 
but when you buy hardware, like buy and lock yourself into that. Like it's right. not going to stop working in two years. It's not going to like, you can do whatever you're going to do. I mean, for instance, Big Sur is coming out. I'm not going to up, you know, I'm not going to update the Big Sur. My, my computer is running great right now. It's, it's yeah. a mean, there's no reason to do anything. So just lock yourself in. The only time it's going to get crazy is if you're running Pro Tools and Avid goes and they go, well, in order for you to get this feature, you're going to need to get the M1 chip. But look, they're almost two years behind on some of the technology that they haven't even implemented yet. You know, some of the QuickTime technology and the bounce into a QuickTime movie and stuff like that. Although I think their new update just took care of that. So I don't think we have to worry that for a while, but Scott, you'd be a good one to keep your eye on that because you def it's definitely going to affect you. Anyway, we're talking about all this stuff, and and one of the things I want to talk about is, um, well, Martin, I'm going to let you you tell the story because when is you know when is a company too big? When do they have too much control? And and how do we fight back? And and uh, Martin has a great story. Why don't you why don't you tell us and we'll we'll start. Well, well, I mean, it's um, you got involved with me, Mike, because. Um, <laughs> We need. We had trouble with a video that I've had out on YouTube for something like you know four or five years. A song called "Me Morena," which um, uh, my own version of it. You did the filming, Mike. You edited it. It's on my record label. And uh, suddenly, after five years, um, YouTube just uh, well, actually, it was Warner Brothers Music just pulled the video down, and uh, they didn't even speak to us. They took it down in May. And uh, their reason for it, it seems, it must be, a, uh, probably Bobby could help me with this, maybe you guys would know as well, that, you know, it's an algorithm thing, it seems, because when I, it was recorded by Josh Groban, and I produced the track on Josh Groban, and Josh wanted to use my demo as the backing track, even though we were going to record it, and he said, I want the demo, I love the demo. So we put Josh's voice on my demo, and we changed a few guitars around and brought some things in. So um, it's Warner Brothers that are taking off my version of the song without even um, uh, without the new recording that was actually put on the um, Josh Groban record. Uh, it's been up for five years. It's still up on the CD it's Baby actually, Top. top it's longer, and, it's and longer I, than I that. Said, and I sent it. I said, and it's really my second most famous song for myself. So it's a. It was a big, big YouTube video. Big YouTube, a big song for me. Uh, they didn't call us. They didn't say, hey, you know, we want to check with you, even though it's uh, written by Martin Page, produced by Martin Page. It's on Ironing Board Records, my own label. They just basically took it down. Now, you know, we were confused about it, but then we said, well, what we'll do is we'll give it to Mike and he'll speed it up by five seconds and uh, we'll put it again. Bang, it was off in two, two minutes. Uh, they, you know, so it's very, very frustrating. And then my manager, you know, has been writing to Google, YouTube and Warner Brothers, uh, emails galore. And no response back for a month. Nothing, just nothing. Not dead. So we've got to bring our attorney in um, to, to get involved. Uh, and because of the virus, you know, we can't really walk into the offices of Warner Brothers, knock on somebody's door, and say, "Hey, guys, you know, let's let's this this is a this is a this is my uh, income. This is my own music. This is my own. I, I I wrote this song and did the demo before Josh Groban even put the record out." Um, and it seems, you know, it's an algorithm thing where they're listening to the track and saying that sounds very much like Josh Groban because Josh wanted to use a lot of elements from the demo. So it's one of those straight, I've never had it happen before, um, but there we are, you know, and again, the, the secret seems to be you speed it up. Well, we did that with Mike. Mike did a great job on it and we thought let's, before we get this settled, we'll put it out and uh, get it up. But within even speeding up by five seconds, it was pulled down within about a second, it was like, bang. And then you know that's a computer reading it. And I can see from Bobby below there that, you know, and when long time ago when we were gonna do um, re-recording of the Q-Fill record, Bobby Summerfield said to me, you gotta be very careful because if you use a snare drum or a, a certain element of the record, uh, again, they're gonna, it's gonna be copy, uh, a copyright problem. Um, the, ir the irony of this is that we, we felt somebody should pick up the phone and say, this is your record, right? On Ironing Board. You wrote it. You produced it. It's all you. And uh, you paid for the, the video. And it's not Josh Groban. But no, it was just pulled down without any communication. And of course, because of the virus, it's a little hard to, to talk to people on the phone, uh, as you probably all know. So um, it's a bit of a dead end unless you get a, 
and we've got to we've got to get involved with an attorney who we um, we've got to pay to go for this. So um, and of course you, you're losing. It's not a lot of money, but you know from May on to this period, that was my biggest earner as a as a YouTube streaming track. It's the uh, second most uh, my second most powerful song as a, as an, uh, a solo artist. So it's a little rather frustrating. And Mike, I was thinking Mike could, could fix this. And he couldn't, so we've got to... <laughs> <laughs> and I failed. I failed big time. Well, you know what, though, Martin? The, the one thing you didn't mention, which you told me, and I think just makes this even really frustrating, is they got um, they got a little upset. Like, they were starting to threaten to pull off all your stuff well, it, it, the, the problem, the as you is, tried to keep posting. Yeah, but Vanessa, who works, uh, has been with me for many years over on the East Coast. As a, she sort of runs my websites and everything, and she puts all the videos up. And we said, well, put it up again. And um, it was pulled down again. So we said, okay, let's change the title. You know, Martin Page, demo, me, Marina. You know? Bang, off again. And then the third time she tried it, YouTube said, if you keep trying to put this video up, we're going to take all of Martin Page's videos off. So you go, ooh, okay, okay, we'll go quiet again. So, yeah, you can't, you can't keep uploading for a while, otherwise they think you're um, from Russia or something. But, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it's one of those situations where we thought we could sort it out quickly ourselves but we've got to get a major attorney in you know just to make little things like this take place and as mike says you know you feel like you're being it's a big brother thing because it's not speaking to anybody it's just going this track sounds like that track off and so you say well let's take off josh groban's video <laughs> let me take off warner brothers videos it's just not going to happen you know what i mean Really quick, really quick, uh, Bobby. I want to get your input on this, but before we get your input, uh, Mr. Rob Arbiter is joining us. So Ta-da. here he comes. Connecting, connecting. Here he comes. Three, two, one. There he is. Finally joining us, the Iron Man of the Audio Nowcast. Oh. He did not hey, lose Rob. a streak, Rob Arbiter. <laughs> Hey, everybody. Sorry for the delayed Iron Man entrance. We have not talked for 30 minutes. We've just been sat- <laughs> he's on, he's on <laughs> base just waiting here. for you to come on. You know, we, uh, we said keep quiet until he comes. <laughs> uh, no, let me just tell you this, though, Rob. Uh, you had a lot of friends here that were uh, concerned Sorry. and ready, ready to come and knock on your door. Yeah, so just so I was going to drive over there, Rob. I was starting to get a little. <laughs> I've been yeah. concerned, too. I've been dealing with a bit of an emergency, but all good now. Okay, well, I'm glad, and that makes sure. me happy to see you here. Um, just to catch you up to speed, um, Martin posted, he's had a video uh, on YouTube for, I think it's more like seven years, buddy. Uh, yeah, but you're had, right. This is about had, time. had a ton of views, um, and YouTube pulled it down because it was, they were saying that it was, uh, I don't know. It was Warner Brothers. Warner, Warner, Warner Brothers. Brothers. Did, right? yeah. Because I'd, re- I'd produced the track on Josh Groban, and I do, and Josh wanted to use a lot of my demo on it, Rob. And so the, the, uh, they keep on hearing, you know, even though we put different overdubs on it, uh, Warner Brothers suddenly had a decision to say, uh, this is, you're, you're nicking the track that you produced and wrote yourself and performed yourself on your own label. And uh, they pulled it down. Well, it's about time. I've been trying to get them to pull that thing down. <laughs> Thank you, mate. <laughs> I'll see you later. It's I bye. <laughs> How does it take seven years? Yeah, I mean this is a this is a really really strange thing, you know. And and, there's, and the videos up on um, on CD Baby and Topic, they don't have a problem. But suddenly, you know, and it's an algorithm thing because we've tried to put it up four or five times. We tried to speed it up, Rob, with with Mike. He sped it up by five percent. It was pulled down instantly. Then now, and then we thought we changed the title of it, you know, even though. I produced Josh Groban on the track. I wrote it. It's all my, my instrumentation, um, you know, and I produced the track. So it's really quite bizarre that they didn't call us or just say, hey, you know, we've had this for seven years. It's Ireland Board Records. Is this really? But I think it's an algorithm thing, and we can't get anybody on the phones because of the virus. Of course. And every time you email thousands of emails, nothing comes back. Um, and then we try. I'll finish here, but we tried to post it. A number of times in different ways, and then we got threatened with if you try, if you try to push us up again, uh, we're going to take all your videos off. So uh, you feel like you're talking to Big Brother a little bit. A tiny <laughs> you, bit know if, you know, you know, if you got to the right human, they could fix it, but there is no right human. 
There you go. There you go, Rob. Yeah, we got to get an attorney involved. So that's what we got to do now. Yeah. I doubt that the attorney is even going to help you on this. To be honest with you, this, this is yeah. a common problem um, from Content ID. Content ID is the fingerprint technology that. So when somebody uploads something, it there's a it recognizes right away what it is, and then it will go out and it will search the web, wow. YouTube, to see if there's something similar. And if there is, then it comes back to the to the copyright owner, or who they think is the copyright owner, and the copyright owner then has number, a number of choices. The choices would be to say, um, you can either put advertising on it, or you can take it down, or I can choose not to do anything. Now, that generally doesn't happen so you know you, you usually get one of two things either take it down or let us put advertising on it we're going to get all the money I so see. I this see. is a real common thing that happens there's yeah. artists who have complained that content ideas actually spotted their own song yes yes on their yes. own channel yes. and issued takedown requests Yes, yeah, yes. It, it, it's something that, that's there. Now, you can dispute it. They that's do, what we're doing, yeah. yeah. They have channels that, that you can dispute. And you can get through, you, you can't get through to a real person, but you can get through in, in, in the, the uh, dispute area. The, uh, the real problem here is, like you, you, you tried, that they will... Uh, basically take down your channel if you know it, it, there's you get a number of um, of hits yeah uh, strikes against you yeah yeah if you get three strikes that means you're gone and, yeah, that's, and what we, that's what we were facing yeah at that point there is no going back you cannot go back yeah. to yeah, I was very. Yeah, I really appreciate that, Bobby. I mean, that was very. You explained it very clearly to us. You know, Laurie Soriano is my attorney, and she she's very close to everybody at Warner Brothers, and 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 uh, in Warner Brothers Publishing as well. And I'm still close to Josh Groban's people. So we, you know, I think we're going to try and play this a little bit more personal. But as you as you pointed pointed out, in this virus period, nobody uh, is in the offices. Nobody's picking up the phones, and. Um, it's just slowed everything down. Um, but we, we, as you pointed out there, it seems like it's not an easy situation to, to uh, get to the bottom of quickly. No, anyway. Everybody complains about it. And generally speaking, the way it works is, is this. In a record label, this is something that's so low level. Yeah. I'm talking about one step above interns. That yes. are actually taking care of this. Yes. So, yeah. It's not like you're going to talk to the head of business affairs and they're going to say, oh, let's go. They probably don't even know themselves. That's, yes, that's I'm sure you're right. Yeah. Yeah. So let me ask you, Bobby, um, would it be the same whether we're in COVID or not? I mean, this just sounds like it's just a cold, heartless computer. Exactly. You know? the, and people have been having the problem for years and years. I, I, again, I, I had, what, what, what's an irony here is what you, what you all broke up. It's been up there for seven years. It's got 360,000 plays and billions of, you know, comments. And then it's like, bang, all of a sudden after seven years. And even the album that was on with Josh, which I produced, was um, closer, was, uh, you know, seven years ago as well. Uh, so it's like, bizarre that they suddenly read it after all this time. Well, something could have flagged it, and it could have been, you, if there's 360,000, maybe it was when you hit number 350,000. <laughs> <laughs> Pull it down! It's too many plays. Pull the bugger down. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell because it's a moving target. They keep on changing what that algorithm is, and we're always chasing it to find out what you know what's going That's on. That's a good point, though, Bobby. It could be that there is something that sets it off because it gets to a certain success level because there's millions of people singing Me Moraine on YouTube, and they get you know, 20, 30-year-old grandmothers are singing it. But this particular video, because it was on my album, has gone very, very, very up to high numbers. So maybe you're right. It hits a certain number, and one of us go, that's one of our songs. You know, it's Josh Groban. Pull it down. It's 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 showing up at a certain level. You know. Well, again, it's not Warner Brothers. It's not Warner's. It, it's it's YouTube Content ID. Okay, so on the video though, it says uh, Warner Music Group um, have have taken this down. 
Yes, but again, it's content ID that flags it. It's it's the the technology the, is YouTube is what you're saying. Fingerprints. It, it's the YouTube fingerprinting technology that that catches it. Then they send a message over to I say Warner Brothers. And then there's somebody within Warner Brothers that whose job it is is to let's get as much as. Isn't we it can. a shame? Isn't it a shame that they don't send um, Josh Groban's version to me on Iron Ball Records, who first recorded it, and say, "Pull down Josh Groban, Martin. Do you want to take it down?" You know, it's like Warner Brothers obviously and YouTube have made a choice here to say this is a Warner Brothers record with Josh Groban. Who's this Martin Page? You know, we we both got solo careers. The big labels one's huge, one's medium. Yeah, the big labels have a lot of weight. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I yeah. I know this is hopelessly naive, optimistic, and counterculture of me, but this whole thing really fits into what you were saying earlier, Mike, about you know these companies getting too big for their britches. Avid exactly. Apple. So here, a couple of things. Google just shut down Google Play which I was sad about because I liked Google Play and I'd subscribed to it for a long time. And so after doing a bunch of research, I switched over to, you know, a, a smaller streaming company called Cobuz, Q-O-B-U-Z, which has high quality stuff. And I'm happy with that. Here is the question about YouTube. I'm frustrated because all of a sudden I'm seeing ads all the time in front of other people's content. And I yeah. did for a long time because... I have a YouTube channel that I add to frequently. Yeah. So I've been thinking for the last several months about Vimeo instead. And the question that I have is, do we have to do this because YouTube is just such a 900 pound gorilla that there's no chance of going over to an alternative video streaming service? Is that, is that it? as I said, hopelessly naive question. And uh, does Facebook have the same issues? Well, to a lesser degree, but it's only been the last year, 18 months, that they instituted their own version of Content ID. They didn't have it. Now, as a result, Content ID is the thing that allows you to monetize videos, whether your own or somebody else's. That's the whole thing that, that, that makes the, the, the monetization stream work. So if you don't have that then nobody can get paid. So there's a good side and there's a bad side. Let me ask you a question, Bobby. What's, have, you, uh, have you heard of anybody that's been victorious in this? I mean, as, you know, have you, do you know anybody that's actually won? Uh, yes, I can't say who, but I, you know, I've read you know, through the ages here that people have on occasion that they've, they've you know dealt with it and it's mostly um disputing it in the right way you can't get anybody on the phone unlike on facebook facebook you actually can get somebody on the phone but in youtube you can't so therein lies the problem you ha just have to follow their protocols that's really that's a, thank you bobby that that's a, that uh, enlightened me a great deal thank you yeah it's really interesting and to be honest it's really depressing because you got these companies that are just, just behemoths and, and they're so important to our lives and our livelihood, especially now, you know, especially now that we are so um, isolated from each other and our creativity comes out, you know, on these, on these platforms. So there's a pro and there's a con, but man, there just needs to be a better way. I mean, they need to be able to, to fix the dispute. I mean, no doubt they probably well i just I, let me just jump in here i was going to say sure. to bobby then you know i mean when when they're about to pull something down doesn't it seem logical that the, the video you're going to pull down you reach out to the people before you pull it down and say we are we are quibbling over this we think it's this and we're about to pull it down the only time they'll do that is if they want to put advertising on it. If they want to okay. monitor the video, then they'll reach out and they'll say, guess what? You have this choice. You can either take it down or we're okay. going to advertise it. Yeah, you said that before, yeah. yeah. Okay. Otherwise, they do have the option. that They can just say, no, take it yeah. down. Now, I'm surprised they didn't do that because yeah. it's in their interest to actually you know, do something like that. Yeah. Yeah, that, but I've done so much tonight, and I'll pass it on to my management as well, what you're saying. That's I, very well, interesting. Bobby, well, Paige, Bobby, 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 Bobby,
this than I do, but it also seems to me if you could get Warner Brothers involved, like that's at least you have, you know, a 700 pound gorilla to talk to their 800 pound gorilla. And well, I was saying that to Bobby. We, 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 yeah, that's, that's what we were thinking, Rob, because we do have relationships with people at Warner Brothers. And of course, because I produced Josh, I don't know what this means, but there was a good relationship between everybody involved. And we were thinking, I'm sure as Robbie, as, as Bobby just said though, they probably go, what? We have no idea of this. But we do have contacts and we do have people that we can speak to and say, is there uh, a communication through on a different level? We'll just have to try everything. And as, as Bobby says, you know, do the right protocols, keep on hammering at it, and then try and get to Warner Brothers. And, um, you know, it's a, it does come down to, in a way, you can only try your personal relationships anyway and say, is there somebody we could talk to regarding this? Because um, I have good relationships with Josh and it's a song that he loves and he wouldn't want to be saying, you can't have, you know, my version was out before his. So I understand it's a big label, but I think if they all knew what was going on, we might get a little a little hand a help there. I just think with a company like YouTube, like losing one or two artists would be meaningless to them, but yeah. losing all of the brothers would actually, it still wouldn't kill them, but it would be meaningful. Oh, like, sure. 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 So sure. this sure. could become a little bit of a cause celeb for Warner Brothers to be fighting for. I just think it helps the chances. That's just a guess, but. It, everything's worth a shot at this point. I mean, it, as you say, it does feel, just talking to everybody here, that it is, it's an uphill climb. And it's, uh, you know, you just got to keep on at it and, and try every avenue you possibly can. But also, uh, as Bobby's made me aware, it's been going on for a long time, you know, and it's, uh, and it's, it's rife out there. But then again, that, that is that computer thing, isn't it? You, 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 I've got a lot of songs out there that I've done my own versions of, but other people have recorded, but my versions are on my label. And you're always looking down and go, I wonder if they're going to pull that down. You I mean, it is, it, is a, it is a fact that me, Morena, this particular track, when Josh wanted me to produce it, he said, I want the demo. So a lot of what he sings on is the demo. And it is, this computer is reading it going, I know that drum beat, I know those pads, I know this melody. I don't know how they really do that, but it seems like they... I know of, I know of examples where tracks have been taken down because they've been duplicate songs and they were not even the same track. They were just simple. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, not, it, it's, it's more evil than you would think. Yeah, uh, I think well, it was interesting what Bobby said though because it's been up for seven years. It's got three hundred and sixty thousand plays, and yeah. um, all of a sudden they go now, take it down now. <laughs> you go right. why seven years? What what as happened? Person, as a person who writes algorithms, I can uh, tell you that a lot of times you'll put in a weird little threshold. Like the threshold might have been three fifty. Well, Bobby said, yeah. Because you do that a lot of times to make it harder to predict because no one would ever think, well, the, the threshold must be 359, 917, you know? Yes. So a lot of times yes. you put in a threshold that seems random like that. Oh, okay. People off. So, oh, well, okay. well, hey, listen, Martin, you got to keep us uh, informed oh, on what's happening on this I whole will. thing because uh, I, I, I think it's fascinating. I think it's, like I said, it's a little depressing and hopefully... It's great to talk uh, about because, yeah. I, as Bobby said, there's so many artists out there that are like independent artists such as myself yeah. that have got lots of tracks out there that I've recorded myself and other people have recorded. And, and really, you know, uh, me, Morena, uh, on iTunes and on my... Spotify and all that stuff and on plays on YouTube as you said I'm getting great streaming from it so in a, since May that streaming and that income has stopped and that's yeah. really why we did the video with you and we knew it was a very powerful song and that's been yeah. in our own independent world quite important to us so to be crushed by Big Brother when we're still just moving along as a small bakery does yeah. uh, get up your nose a bit yeah <laughs> Hey, we're going to move on. Uh, but yes, we will definitely keep keep posted. But you know, that brings up something. Um, the next thing I want to talk about, which is actually uh, kind of falls into line with what we're talking about with demos is, is Martin, you're releasing an album that just dropped on Tuesday, right? What and That's right. It's, it's mainly your demos and a couple new songs. But yeah. Um, it's really interesting because it got me thinking about demos and it got me thinking about, you know, why demos, especially when you can buy an artist's um, demo song, why they're 
they're so important because really, if you follow a songwriter and, and you get to hear a demo version of a song, there's a lot of change that happens between the demo version and the artist released version. And, and so if you really want to kind of understand and kind of want to get into the mind of a songwriter, listen to their demos because that's basically their pure raw vision of what the song is. And, and so Martin, tell us a little bit about, about the album. And then, and then I'm going to ask you a couple of questions about the demo process in general, you know? Well, you know, for, for, a, year, for a year now, I've been doing my uh, own radio, uh, radio, radio Owl's Nest podcast. So every month um, I go on, I, I put a podcast out um, an hour long and I, I infiltrate that with songs from my career, all about me. It's very egocentric, but it's all the demos of all, my, all through my career. And um, a lot of humor, just fun, but I will play rare demos. We Built the City, These Dreams, King of Wishful Thinking, everything that I've done, and some new demos that I'm working on. It's just like a, a workshop. It's great fun. But as the year went through, a lot, of, a lot of my fans, supporters said, oh, we love this song, we love this and I, net, I throw in a new one that I was working on but wasn't finished. And they go, oh, why don't you put that on an album? And I was like, yeah, these are demos. But then I remember Pete Townsend years ago, you know, doing Scoop and all those Who are demos. And I thought, this is a really nice idea. So to make a long story short, I compiled the songs that I played on the radio show for a year, uh, put 26 songs together with about four new ones um, and different versions as well, alternate versions. Um, couple of things I did with Josh Groban I did alternate versions of and different album versions and um, I put it on a double album two days ago uh, called the poetry of collisions because I just thought all oh, these are all different styles all just hitting each other it's a reggae song half demo acoustic folk song songs I'd written for Robbie Williams and we put it out two days ago it was great fun to you know to to put, to put these roughs out you know because when you're young you're very precious about your music and you're really like you know Oh, uh, you know, this is just a this is just a, just a guide. But um, actually, it's been my, my most successful record. <laughs> it, it, instantly, it sold more than I've ever put. You know, all my deep records, they're like, give us the demos. Um, so it's, uh, you know, and it was nice to do a double album. Um, and it was nice to um, throw caution to the wind because some of these demos were from cassettes. And, you know, and then I did a whole liner note, which everybody can download which is talking about exactly the time the record, the demo was recorded, what it was recorded on, Fostex 8-track, you know, 1999. And then I wrote, I wrote down all the keyboards I used, just like Pete Townsend would do on Scoop, the microphones I sang through. And then you make apologies, you know, because there's dropouts, of, uh, but it's like in Magnetic, the song I wrote for Earth, Wind & Fire. It's the original cassette demo, straight from the cassette demo, Animal Instinct for the Commodores. And these are cassette demos, you know, made on a Fostex 8-track back in the 80s. And, um, and then next to it is a 24-track, you know, analog SR demo. Um, loads of fun and good for my soul because you're actually brave enough. And I think as older artists get like this, we tend to go, we're going to be dead in a few years. Get everything out as soon as you possibly can. Uh, <laughs> But some of the demos are mono, you know, you go like, uh, you have to say, what you're listening to is swing, swinging from the right to the left, and then you'll hear a, a dog bark in the background. That's how this demo was done. But it was, it was, it was great for me, and I must admit, the fans, the, what, what your pressure's about when you're young and you just want to be great. When you get older, even for me, 40 years on, I listen to some of these demos, and I go, God, that's really good. It's really good. What energy? What energy, you know? Why I was singing so high and why have my tempos got so slow? You know, so it's, you get a different, re I think Paul McCartney said it recently as well. He said when he listens back to the Beatles early demos, which he was terrified to listen to, he would say, I've got another, another outlook on them, you know, and I, and I'm getting feedback where people were saying, oh, I had no idea the song started this way, but I can hear in the record what they copied and I can hear what they didn't get right. Yeah, you know, mostly I hear like, we prefer the demo to the bloody record, you know? So um, it's just a really nice project and it's allowed me to, um, and it's volume one, you know, it's 26 songs. <laughs> I've got volume two in the, you know, sitting there, which is another 26 songs, but it's, uh, it's great. You know, you feel in a way you're not doing anything totally professional. And I think the big thing that was so beautiful, um, 
and it was just a download album because CD Baby now doesn't do CD. So we had to make a download record. But all the fans were saying, can we see how you did these demos? So we did a real in-depth, brief history of the recording of the songs and more, you know? So we would say, these were the microphones used. These were the limiters used. This is my system in the eighties. This is my system in the nineties. Um, Brian Fairweather played on this demo. Jack Hughes played on a song for the world cup in 1986. Um, just great fun. But I think the liner notes made all the difference because you're sort of owning up to the way you did it. And a lot of the nerds and a lot of the people get off on that. So it was good fun. Good fun. Let me, let me ask you, um, First of all, you know, I think it's really like I was saying uh, when I introduced the segment, it's really great to hear songwriters and to hear their demos um, because you really get a, a, a taste of the vision. You've yeah. written so many demos for so many different artists. I just want to ask you a couple of questions having to do with demos. Number one, um, is there an artist that's actually covered one of your songs that um, – that surprised you as to their interpretation of your demo? Um, well, I would say that um, Robbie Robertson, when he, we did his, he, on his solo record, we wrote together a song called Fallen Angel, and I had lots of demos of that that I would take to him at the village. And uh, my demo was very um, Trevor Hornish and very English choral, um, choral work, hymnal, it's a hymnal song. And then when Daniel Lenoir came in and Manu Cachet on drums and Peter Gabriel did the background vocals, it turned into a subliminal reggae song. So, and that was, it, it got better. You know, it did change. So I can remember that. And the other thing I can remember is that these dreams for Heart, the demo was very techno and very English. I, I was writing it like orchestra maneuvers in the dark. And uh, as you can tell with Heart, they just basically stripped it all back because they didn't think it was going to be a hit single, but they loved the song. And they just put a pad down, a drum machine, and she sang it. And at first, when I heard that, I thought, I don't like that. It's just too simple. It's, there's more to this song. But I think that's what made it go all the way through. You know, We Built the City was a very techno demo, very different when they made the record. And as you well know, Mike, you know, I didn't like the record when I first heard it, because you know, I thought it was um, to umpa umpa umpa, and we were doing a, a funky song. So the demos always you know and ma majority i don't want to take all the time but the majority is you don't like what other how other people do it you're grateful they did it you're thrilled but usually my first impression was i call a manager we call i am a manager and go like what the have they done to it <laughs> why didn't they play the chords i wrote you know <laughs> why didn't, and, and, you know you go like why didn't they change that suspended <laughs> chord that's what makes it and uh, usually you're more upset you know than, than happy but you're happy they record it but you will often go this is the last thing i say they're, that you think they overthink it you know they, they do more than they need to do and uh, but then i've got to say again that the really good producers would bring me in you know they'd say we want to know how you did this and play keyboards on it and uh, they'd even transfer it from my demo i mean paul young's record they transferred my demo over with don was and they just and Jeff Beccaro played on top of the demo. So some of the producers would say, we aren't going to be able to beat the demo. Let's get it across and play on top of it. And, um, you know, that, those, that's really lovely. To, lo lovely when a producer does that, says, I, I still want your background vocals, you know. And it's the same thing with Josh, Josh Groban. I said, well, we'll re record this again. And he goes, no, I just want to sing in your garage on what you got. I love it. So um, that's, that's, why, that's why my video isn't on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, well, that's because you, you know, with your demos, you have a certain vibe and a certain feel. Like I remember, you know, Dance with Light uh, that Brian Ferry did. Um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And how I, they, I couldn't, he, they, they couldn't redo the drum part. They actually had to sample the beginning of your, uh, of your demo because they couldn't recreate that. So Yeah, he did. And he took that, he took that drum off of a cassette. Trevor Horn did and just looped it in. I don't know how he did, but they had some clavier back then and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Spoke, but uh, yeah, in general, you know, you um, you're not. I would say seventy percent. You're not. You're not thrilled, and thirty percent you get turned on and go, wow, you know. But demos and actually, you know, I will stop talking because I've got a big mouth. But um, all my solo records are the demos. 
you know, I, I basically never used to be like that when I was a young writer, but at a certain point when the studios got better, I realized that what I was creating was going to be the record. And so even though I was writing the demo, I was thinking a lot of this has to be thought of as making the record, you know? So I, um, very rarely now do I ever think that if anything gets serious, it's not the demo blowing, getting bigger. And of course we've got automation. When automation came into the picture, that changed everything for me because you thought, my demos can stay as they are and you're not there with your sound craft board every night wondering what you've pushed and start again the next day so i think as automation came in demos became records you know you could have so many different versions underneath the final record you know but demos to me i mean i on a video i just did for the for this new record i said in the promo demos are so important to songwriters yeah. demos are what we live on that's our well, lifeblood. Okay. That's, and demos are the vision. And let yeah. me open it up to everybody. Do any of you guys have like a favorite demo that you've ever heard um, for any song? Any Anyone out there, you know, buy any of those uh, special releases, you know, with the demos? I'll tell you what, I, I won't jump in here, though, uh, while everybody's sort of thinking about it, is that when Peter Gabriel put out that double album of all his demos for the so album and they took it from cassettes and they showed the you know the beginning of the drum programming the next stage when vocals came on when the piano came on and when he would stop and then start again and they actually did it as a track so you could hear how um in your eyes started from him just going uh, making noises and as you hear the drum machine programming change then you hear the drummer come on and you hear how it changes from a um a gospel song into a, a world song. It's really quite interesting to do. That. I've never heard that before, where a person has taken all the different versions of a song and made it into one, just fading in, very cleverly done. So you hear it in your eyes, move in the same key, just moving up, you know, into its final version. Oh, that's, that's cool. Good. Yeah, that's cool. I think and I've just stunned everybody there. They're going <laughs> like, you know, we don't want to talk anymore. He's taken all the air away. There's no word. <laughs> There's no room, Martin. There's no room. <laughs> well, I have an answer for you, Mike. I have my personal favorite demo along those lines, and it is from XTC, from an album they did about uh, 20 years ago. There's a tune I got it. called yeah. I'd Like That, and then yeah. they did a, did the demo album of, that al of the album. I can't remember the name of the album, but the demo version of the song is so charming. It sounds like a cassette. And you hear Andy Partridge say, oh, this is a new song called I'd Like That. Sorry for my horrible British accent, Martin. I apologize <laughs> immediately. Uh, and he just plays it. And there is something about the spontaneity of it and just the beauty of the fact that it's just his voice and his acoustic guitar. I just, I don't know. Demos are special. Yeah. I agree. There's an energy to them that you don't always get when you yeah. uh, go and reproduce the thing, you know? Yeah. Yeah. My favorite, the... Uh, the one that this conversation reminds me of is when I was working with Michael Jackson, which is a long time ago in the 90s. Uh, he used to do all of his demos just with his mouth. Like he'd sing all the instrumental parts. Mm -hmm. He would multi-track the demos and basically sing, here's what the drums are, here's what the bass is, here's what the guitar is, here's what the piano is, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, I actually have... Well, I have all the demos that I did with him that way where if he had an idea, he would either have an idea for a whole song or he'd have an idea for an overdub and he would just call and sing the parts. And it didn't matter. It could be a clave or a piano or a bass or anything. And he would just sing that part. And I have, uh, I, I never know what's been leaked to the internet or not, but I've never leaked it. I have the original <laughs> demo he did for Beat It. Wow. Uh, wow. Every single part. And it's, wow. it's staggering how close the record ended up being to what he said. That's amazing. Um, yeah. That's amazing. Um, it makes me sad, by the way, when those things get out without the artist's permission, that just makes me sad. That feels like a violation. I know a lot of that stuff gets out there. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. for me. Yeah. I, I, I'm a... I'm a junkie for the Beatles, so anytime they release anything mm. with the Beatles, and they've yeah, released totally. a lot of really great great demo stuff and a lot of outtakes and to me it's just it's in some ways 
when you hear a, a super raw demo, it's almost like you're in the room with them. When you're in the room, like writing with them, and they're just kind of just noodling and put stuff down. It's really and, and in a way crazy. also with the Beatles because they did a lot in the studio at the time. It all happened sort of around that. The app, the you know, take one, take four, take twenty is very interesting as well because you can hear that there. George Harrison is thinking about what guitar he's going to play on Get Back later on. So here and you know. Uh, Take 12 and take one, I find really interesting. And you can hear when Paul McCartney does a first guide on a, on a you know, singing Mate Lady Madonna, you can hear that he hasn't got all the words and everything. And I think that stuff is, is fantastic because it takes, the pres- it takes the preciousness away yeah. and makes you realize that humans are... Right, it humanizes are their, is the work. Yeah. I love it. I just, I like it when yeah. it's released by the... By the artist or by the owner, yeah. Sure. Some second engineer stole it and and put sure, it. Sure, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Jumping yeah, love- on the jumping on the Beatles demo thing. Let us not forget "Free as a Bird" and "Real Love," yes. which yeah. were John's demos. Yeah. And then Paul and George and Ringo wrote, recorded with them after he died. It's amazing. Yeah. Yes, yeah. it is. Cool. And that was a cassette demo. That's all they yeah. had, wasn't it? Yeah. It's so yeah. lovely to you know to have. I mean, we've all just gone through every Beatles, you know, little morsel that there possibly is. And I remember sure. when those two songs were released, it's like, oh, we get two more Beatles songs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I remember when Andrew Sheps, he actually told the story on the podcast years ago. Um, and he was saying when he worked with you too, um, they just started rolling. They just recorded everything. Like, Hit play, yeah. and they just you know while they were writing, and that's that. I think that's really cool. That just means there's a lot of really great stuff that's out there. But you know what? Also means there's probably a lot of really not so great stuff that's out I, there. I, I think you're so, right there. Yeah. So the 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 key, you know, what makes demo album releases so special is that somebody has kind of gone through it and kind of gleaned the good stuff because people yeah. that roll all the time. There's a, <laughs> well, I think that's, I think I think you can stuff. imagine it with you two because they don't always you don't feel like they're that they're a songwriting band as much as though a lot a lot sort of happens as a as a unit. But even the Beatles on the Get Back record, if you listen to them, you know all through that record, there's a lot not going on. There's a lot of just you know they've, they they have run out of ideas. So yeah. you know you you always dream. I think always that the do you hear the demo of maybe the, the couple of writers or one at home who started strumming something and then he brings it in? Just like uh, Rob was saying for Beat It, you know that there's something going on. This is very song oriented straight away. Um, those are the demos that get me when I go like, somebody's hit a gold nugget here. And uh, they didn't quite get the middle eight yet. But listen, this is a, such a great inspiration. I think it encourages people writers, young writers, to hear demos. I, I, go, I went to UCLA a couple of times to play, to talk and play the demos that we built at the city, and I was very nervous, you know, because I thought, these are young kids, you know, and I'm playing with built the city, and they're going to go like, oh, my God, you know, what a lot of crap. This is 90s fucking big hair, starship, you know. And they all, and the demo's <laughs> nothing like the record. It's all, yeah. dun, dun. it's like Shop the Monkey. Of dun, 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 dun. And, and as soon as I was playing it, I was, I was going, it's only a cassette. It's only eight track lads. <laughs> it's a quarter inch. You know, I had one microphone, one delay unit, and uh, all the kids after put their hands up and said, we prefer the demo to the record. <laughs> the, hey. the feel, the feel, you know, it's the feel. You know, you know we're going to start wrapping this up, but one thing I want to talk about, the last thing I want to say about demos is I think certain uh, genres of music, I think the demo isn't going to be around and isn't around. I, it could be, Mike. That's a, good, that's a very good point. Yeah. Specifically, like a lot of EDM, a lot of dance stuff, because yes. the songs, I think, kind of evolved in the way technology is. You yes. don't really have to demo. You just start right. going, and it just, they kind of evolve. I'm not saying that yeah. there probably aren't demos out there, but when you watch these YouTube videos of people creating and stuff, they kind of start and it just it just evolves and there's there's yes. not really a demo per se it's yes. it's just it's just keeps revolving part of the Which, purpose of a demo also used to be that you couldn't do something at master quality at home or while you were writing you know now yeah. you yeah. can so your very yeah. first idea is going to sound good enough for the radio if it's a good enough idea so that whole delineation Pretty true yeah yeah i think well, it's hey, another oh i was just going to say i think it's yet another example of 
um, how much creative work is actually being lost as a result of the digital revolution, right? Think about all of the words that, you know, yeah. have been written into word processors that'll never, you know, that'll never see yeah. the light of day after the people are gone and so forth. I, you know, that's, so, that's so true because look, let's face it. Do you know what the, you know what the new demo is? And I just thought of this. The new demo is when you, it's just a different session. Like I just finished writing some songs for a project I'm working on. And one song I had literally like 12 different versions. Cause I'd go and I'd take a left turn here, but I'd come back and take a left. So like, I don't have anything recorded. I just have all these different, you know, all these different versions, all these different, you know, sessions. And I think that's our new demo. That's the, that's the new demo. So I think anybody, Rob, Rob, what Rob brought up, there's a really good point though, you know, is, is technology is so important to, you know, to, that has affected the demo. You know, it was an era where you, you would be have your cassette machine and you would play your guitar and sing it and bring it to the band. And that's not really the same now. It's different, different to that. Which is why any label record labels that still exist don't want to hear demos they just want your first idea to be the one ready for the radio absolutely well absolutely absolutely I, yeah I, that's great well hey look i think that's a good place to to end it when we just killed the demo right there <laughs> so uh, <laughs> no it's but, gonna live on i'm gonna go back in the room and pick up the acoustic guitar i've still I, got my cassette machine so i still record on my cassette machines <laughs> Hey, Mark, good. you got to join us more often because you won't you know you won't have if i feel like you have like it was a damn that burst and all this conversation came out so you can't <laughs> stop my mouth when I you come, you, thank god thank god there wasn't bobby here either yeah you, 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 you come come and join we, us <laughs> you know, i've had a great time and i tell you what i've got to thank bobby again for helping me with me marina see that clearly it's really great to see you guys again it was great fun great fun but, it's good to see you. Really quick, uh, tell us where we can uh, get your album one more time. Well, it's a bit. Well, a bit, that go. I think it Q Buzz, Go Buzz. It's on that on there, which uh, we were talking about. Uh, um, and of course, it's on iTunes. It's on all, all all the platforms. You know, it's all the all the platforms. And it's it's a bit of a thrill, really, because you put a double album out, and uh, you can't choose the price that iTunes are going to choose. So you're going like, I'm putting 26 songs out. I hope they don't sell it for $3. <laughs> you know, you can never tell. And I remember the day that I looked at it, it was $20. And I thought, oh, yes, that's really 26 songs for $20. That sounds real. That sounds better. But, yeah, it's iTunes. It's Spotify. It's uh, Pandora. It's all, all, all those sites. And, of course, we, we went through CD Baby because we've always worked with them. But this year they stopped making CDs. And I put a tester out of an EP about um, two months ago to see how the distribution was. And of course, CD Baby is now, you know, you, don't, you can't release straight away. You have to wait five weeks during the pandemic. So you have to do your projects well ahead of time. Now they're just baby, right? Because no <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. yeah, it's funny. They're still calling themselves CD. It must be, it must be and, wait, um, you got to wait five weeks? Five weeks at the that's, moment. They say, that's it's the all virus. digital. Yeah, but it's, it's because the people click. people are all working from home, and they say it's just a, a tough. And because it, uh, in the virus period, everybody put records out. They just went, yeah. they sat at home and just fired thousands of records at CD Baby. You know, like I'll do another single, I'll do this, I'll do. You know, it was a way of a way of doing it. But it went very well. And this uh, this uh, album. Um, we just distributed it everywhere digitally, just everywhere digitally. And it was a little bit of a, a tough one for my fans because they're as old as me. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, they all say, we want a CD, you know, and I had to be quite brutal and say, that's a sign of the times, guys. If you don't want to buy it, then sorry, but there'll be no CDs. It has to be a download. So a lot of people were saying, that means I've got to buy a computer and an iPhone. So I thought, my fans, <laughs> my fans are cavemen. They're cavemen, you know? <laughs> they sent you these messages on a typewriter? I mean, they have to have... <laughs> no, I'm waiting for the letters to come. I'm just waiting for the letters to come in the post. <laughs> uh, that's fantastic. Well, Martin, it's great to have you. It was great. Been, it was a really fun conversation. Lovely um, to see all you boys again. It's, it goes back such a long time, and it's just so lovely to see the faces. We're still here. And the virus is around, but we're still here. It's very positive. Yeah, yeah lovely to see everybody. Um, really quick, anybody want to uh, say anything they're working on? Scott, you working on anything you can talk about? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, <unfortunately>, yeah. <laughs> 
Hey, uh, Nick, how about you? You working on anything you can um, talk about? Yeah. Uh, uh, no. <laughs> Another no. Two no's. <laughs> okay, Rob, how about you? You working on anything you can talk about? Yeah, depending on when is this going to post, do we know? It'll probably post in about four days. Okay, so November 20th, which is more than four days from now, I'm going to be uh, interviewed as part of what's called the, called the Jazz Master Summit. And I'm still not sure exactly what topics I'm going to be talking about. I think uh, more on the technology side. Uh, I've done a bunch of jazz, but they have a bunch of jazz musicians already uh, talking about music. I think I may be talking about technology and trends and uh, recording and home recording and recording during a pandemic and all that kind of stuff. But if you're totally bored and love jazz, check it out. Uh, I will check it out. That sounds exciting. How about you, Bobby? What are you working on? Well, there's a new book in the works and workshop. <laughs> and blog. Uh, you can't tell us what the new book is? Is that, is that a no? Uh, no, we'll wait until it comes out. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a no. Wow. Mike, what are you working on? You've got to have something after yeah. this series of duds here. <laughs> yes, I am. And right now, we are going to premiere uh, the teaser, actually the official trailer for the Audio Now Cast Spaces Around the World 60-minute special. Wow. Excellent. So there it was, guys. That was the uh, that was the teaser trailer for the Audio Outcast Spaces, you know. And uh, great job, great job. Woo! Oh, that that's, when, that's when people traveled. Yeah, people you, could travel. the house. you were actually allowed to get out. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, where did you shoot that Red Thirty Seven console? Was that at Abbey Road? No, that was at uh, British Grove. That oh, was. Oh wow! Uh, they've got that, and they also have a. Um, oh, what is the name of that console? Um, uh, a try? Oh, it's, it's, no, no, it's it's another early console that that. Uh, uh, <laughs> I did notice in the film wasn't wasn't there a Juno sixty? Yeah, five? Juno Juno oh, sixty. Yeah, we. That, that made I mean, my heart flutter. There's, oh, lovely. there's little bits and pieces. There's like Rock yeah. Studios in there, um, Rockfield Studios in there. Actually, the room that they recorded. Uh, Queen Bohemian Rhapsody, Queen, wow. uh, was in there. Um, we actually. Um, uh, Kingsley, who was one of the brothers, and they have a great, I can't wait, they have a documentary coming out on Rockfield Studios. But Kingsley, who was one of the brothers, he actually took us to the spot and he said, this is where Brian May set up his guitar for the guitar solo right here. So it was really great. And it's fun. It's a great, it's a great episode. Now that's in Wales, right, Rockfield? Yeah, that was what? in Wales. And let me tell you, you know you're in Wales when you're driving and you see more consonants than valves in every word. 
<laughs> and I've never seen so many Ys and Xs and Ws in all my life. <laughs> it was it was quite quite entertaining. But anyhow, yeah, that's going to come out in December. It's kind of like a little Christmas gift, and uh, it it it's just the timings now. And it's boy, it took three years to to get all that stuff. So it'll be pretty fun. Um, I hardly great. wait. It looks yeah. awesome. Well, thank you. I really appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you, Barton, for joining us. Bobby, it's good to see you. Thank you for uh, answering all those amazing questions about YouTube yeah. and depressing us all. Because <laughs> 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 they are a big brother. Uh, so uh, from myself and all the guys, oh, by the way, if you have any comments or questions, you can reach us at audio at nowcastnetwork.com. That's audio at nowcastnetwork.com. And hey, I want to I want to say hello to all our new listeners because I put up the Dave Smith uh, uh, podcast on YouTube and we got over 2,000 new listeners just on that. Not, those are different listeners than what we get on our normal IGTV and our normal podcast. So that was actually, that's kind of fun. So I know we probably well, have many, like... Many, what, what is this show number again? What this is, is it? Two, 217, show number 217. And... Okay. And I know that we probably are up to eight or nine listeners now. So, <laughs> Mike, for those new listeners, how long has the Audio Nowcast been on? 14 years. Woo! 14 oh. years. I, I think we're one of the oldest, if not the oldest, pro audio podcasts. You know, it, wow. we've just been doing it for such a long time. And it's all because of you guys, because obviously, look, Martin just has so much to say. So when he comes on, he just, okay, we got something else to talk about. <laughs> I have to save it up for one show. Every six months. <laughs> when well, we started the podcast. You know, what am I going to say after six months? <laughs> when we started the podcast, we were all young guys, eager starting our career. <laughs> and now we're all wearing glasses. <laughs> Everyone. <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, for myself and all the guys, Thank you so much for listening, and we'll catch you next time. We want to hear those early demos, Joanne. Thanks for listening to the Audio Nowcast, sponsored by API and Wireworld Pro Audio. The Audio Nowcast is hosted by Mike Rodriguez and features a panel with Rob Arbitier, Bobby Osinski, Scott Gershon, Nick Peck, Diego Stucco, Brandon Birdside, Martin Page, Bobby Summerfield, and maybe a guest or two. We'll see you next time. <laughs>